a scientist here at Fund for Food Research, and I'm also the PI for the Consumer Insights team for High Value Nutrition. So late last year, we conducted a survey in China looking at Chinese consumers' attitudes to their health and diet. And um, along came COVID early this year. So we decided that it would be very interesting if we reran the survey to see if there are any changes and what those changes may be. So I'm gonna hand over to Tracy Phelps here, who's gonna walk you through these um, results. And then later Ivy and myself will come back and try and help with any questions you may have. So over to you. Morena, everybody, and thanks, Denise. For that. Um, Denise has introduced things quite fully there, so before we crack on, I'll just um, cover off a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, this is a webinar, so nobody can contribute orally to it this time round, but if you'd like to contribute any questions, and we encourage you to do so, please use the chat function. I've got a little reminder on each slide so you know what you're doing, and when you do that, if you could just select send to all panellists and attendees. That way we can pick up all the questions as we move through. Um, as I've said in our welcoming emails and so forth, the plan is for me to take probably around 20, 25 minutes to go through all of this data, then Ivy and Denise will pop up and answer any questions. Um, but when you are making comments at any point, there's a, a slide number in the top left corner if you want to refer to that to make things simpler when we come back to answering questions. So I'd just like to set the scene because there's been quite a bit going on within the Consumer Insights um, part of the High Value Nutrition National Science Challenge. That's led us to this presentation today. So Ivy and Denise have been very active in the two years leading up to this study, both being out in China quite regularly, um, running qualitative focus groups and interviews around each of the health platforms for HPN, which were infant health, gut, metabolic and immune health. So all of those qualitative learnings gave us a good base in which to launch a quantitative study to get some form of measure of how much those themes were playing out in reality in the market. So in March 2019, in those lovely cherry blossom groups of people out in the park days before COVID was even a word that we'd ever heard, we launched that survey. We ran that and six months later, the pandemic was declared. China was, had, first COVID, had the first COVID deaths and were the first to implement lockdowns. And in fact, the first country to get things under control in that initial wave. As part of all of that, our ongoing HBN research work and much of the clinical work as part of the program has been suspended due to the, the restrictions on travel and so forth. So as part of that, we've had to be a little bit creative in how we can keep feeding you information that's relevant to the program. And for this one, it seemed like a no brainer, really. We had a perfect opportunity here to repeat the quantitative study that we ran in March um, in June, because the, the landscape in China was completely different by June 2020. They were at the peak of the infection rate of COVID. They've had about 85,000 confirmed COVID cases and about 5,000 deaths at that point. So they were well and truly in the thick of um, being affected by the disease. So we capturing quantitative data at this point would give us a really good platform to be able to make the comparisons. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on methodology, but I'm so aware that every time we do a, a presentation like this, a, a large proportion of the questions are about what our methodology was. So I will zip through this quite quickly. As I've mentioned, it's a quantitative survey, which we ran online, obviously, because of the travel restrictions and so forth. The, the survey that we conducted pre-COVID was also online, so that's a direct comparison there. In each of the studies, we aimed for around 3,000 people in uh, the entire test, so around 6,000 in total. Um, all the people we recruited were Chinese and in China, and the surveys were conducted in Mandarin. We focused on people in tier one and two, purely because that's our target market for HVN. We want to export people to uh, products to affluent people who are paying a premium for our products. All the people we talked to had an interest in food and their links with health and well-being. All were above in, um, average income. And we assigned people into different health concern groups that align with what we're doing in HVN. So we had a control group who had no real overlying health issues. 
we had a digestive health group. These are people who consider themselves to suffer from digestive issues more than the average person. So we're talking constipation, diarrhea and bloating type symptoms, whether that's prognosis from a doctor or self um, assigned, we didn't mind. Immune, that group was people again who had an over um, representation of people who suffered colds, flus and sore throats. And a metabolic, we had people who had medically been assigned to a, one of the, the triple highs, whether that was blood pressure, cholesterol or blood sugar. So these people all had health conditions that they were dealing with alongside the control. So we were able to make that comparison within each study, as well as ultimately between the pre and COVID conditions. Um, in terms of the content of the surveys, we were looking very generally at health and diet. So to give you an idea of the structure and the sorts of questions without going to the nth um, level of detail for all of this, we had these 12 themes that covered off that were covered off in the survey. So as you can see, I've highlighted the top one there was general health and importance of being healthy. We then had a battery of questions assigned to that theme, which you can see on the right there. And we asked people to go through each of those statements and indicate how much they agreed or disagreed with those statements. And we did the same thing for each of the points in the 12 themes. So we had eating habits right through to how much, what they thought about multivitamins and supplements, their interests in functional food, trust is a big one, food safety, right down to well-being and exercise. At the end of that, we captured all our standard um, background information, demographics, that sort of thing. And of course, in this year's study, we added on a couple of batteries of questions specific to COVID. Now, they were purposefully put at the end of the, session, of the survey so as not to impact any of the, the previous responses that we were then comparing with the 2019 data. So just to draw your attention to that line scale before it disappears off the screen, because we'll be making reference to that as we go along, it was a seven point line scale. And as we go through, you'll see charts that compare the 2019 with the 2020 data. And if there's an arrow pointing down, we're seeing less agreement. And if the arrow points up, more agreement. So just to keep that in context of what the scale was. So while we appended the, um, the attitudes and post-COVID sentiment sort of questions at the end of our survey, I'm going to present them before we go into looking at comparing the data set because it really gives a bit more context to what was going on at the market in the market at the time that people were answering the survey. So the little grids that you can see on your screen there are just sort of questions that we asked. So we had a battery about diet and lifestyle, and we were just asking people directly. So how do you feel about, do you eat more vegetables, less the same or more than before COVID? What's your financial well-being like, worse the same or better than before COVID? So pretty direct questions. We just wanted to get some top line responses to how people were feeling and moving on after the worst of COVID. So firstly, of course, we were expecting um, there to be a response to financial well-being and as expected given multiple periods of lockdown and the inability to work for many a high proportion of those surveyed which is around the 40 percent so our sort of bluey teal bar in the middle there felt that they're they were, um sorry the gray bar about 40 percent were um worse off after the COVID, COVID pandemic which is is not surprising and i guess much the same in many countries around the world what was interesting is then when we asked them about their overall well-being, around a quarter of our respondents from each of those health groups and our control felt that they fared better overall following COVID. I mean, not to dismiss, of course, from the fact that the vast majority of people do feel they're around, around about the same, but we are looking at those slight shifts on either side of the medium there. What was very interesting was this side, where we see that a huge proportion, two thirds of all those people responding, um, were paying a lot more attention to their health and well-being. So more attention after COVID. So resoundingly, it sounds like COVID had motivated them to take better care of themselves. And as we progress through these slides, we'll see that this is manifesting with people doing more exercise they're cooking more at home and they're eating more fruit and vegetables. So I guess 
Keeping that in mind, going forward, how can New Zealand companies leverage some of this behaviour change specifically? Uh, one side upside of, down, of lockdown is the reduction or the removal of some of the daily commute times. And as we know from previous qualitative research in China, that it's not uncommon for people to be commuting several hours a day. So this recouped time, as we can see in this chart, is potentially allowing them the opportunity to exercise more. As we see, there's around 40% of people who have said they were exercising more um, after COVID and that their physical well-being was better. That's a smaller number, but physical well-being could be measured in other ways. So again, the majority of people, around 60%, saying physical well-being didn't change, was around the same. A very small proportion thought it was worse but that's quite promising that we've got quite a few people up there who are feeling better after, after lockdown. Um, obviously being a lockdown situation has led to a huge uplift in the number of people being able to cook at home. We've got about 60% of the folk that we spoke to said that they were cooking at home more. So that's quite understandable and perhaps is the same as what we've seen here. What was interesting also is around this uplift in how many people were consuming fruit and vegetables. We had around 50 or 40 to 50 percent saying they were eating more fruit and vegetables. And this is a recurring theme a little bit. It's this idea of well-being isn't just focused on diet. It's not just focused on exercise, but there's this general, I'll take a bit of everything in order to get the best bang for my buck. We looked quickly at um, a couple of aspects of purchase behavior. And while most of the people we surveyed again hadn't really changed their, per their purchase behavior since COVID, nearly 30% of those surveyed are looking for products that claim a health benefit more than they did before, which is pretty good news because that's one of our raison d'etre of HVN. However, we will see shortly that overall trust in health claims has gone down a lot since 2019. So it's good news for HVN if we can find this 30% of people who are looking for health claims, which is obviously difficult, but otherwise we need to start thinking about effective ways of, of conveying the credibility of claims to these consumers. So the, the next chart, they're looking at trust around brands. When we asked directly whether people were trusting of imported food brands, Responses were somewhat divided, with around a quarter of respondents saying they are less trusting of imported fruit, food brands. And then the smaller, about 20%, saying they were more trusting. In the broader survey, we will drill down a bit into this, more relative to perceptions of New Zealand, particularly food safety and credibility of our health claims. And what we found is generally consumers are trusting of New Zealand and that the trust around brand New Zealand doesn't appear to have been eroded much since COVID, but we will visit that a little bit more. Okay, um, remembering we had those 12 big health themes that formed the base for us, basis of our survey around from things like general health through to supplements and so forth. For each theme, we compared responses across those health, those health conditions against the control. So I just want to say, in other words, we've got a lot of data here. So in order to sort of keep this presentation today pretty moving along pretty quickly and applicable to sort of most people online, I've had to really pick out the top line areas of interest. What I would like to do at this point is encourage you to ask lots of questions about things that are pertinent to you and your business, but also I will pepper the rest of the presentation with links to the full reports so that you can get any additional information that you need for your business. So first and foremost, these are the arrows I was talking about before. Really, what we've got here is a summarized version of differences between those agree-disagree scales. So the difference between a 2019 response and a 2020 response. So in that top box, being healthy means feeling good both physically and mentally. All the people in the control group in 2020 gave the average score was lower than it was in 2019. So overall, there we can see an, a widespread lowering of agreement scores within this general health and importance of being healthy category. 
since the pandemic, health has taken on a far more serious meaning. There's actually a real risk of death from not looking after your health and the risk of long-term illness or lifelong health issues. So this downward trend suggests that consumers are perhaps more concerned with staying virus-free than just feeling good and healthy. So it's focused their minds, it's focused things on a much more, there's a much more serious tone to the survey results this year. Daily pressures are felt to be less of a concern for those with health conditions. And um, while the control group are now having to think a little bit more about their health, perhaps for the first time. And people are paying more attention to their health than what they did five years ago. Um, the statement about staying healthy to support dependents is an interesting one to have gone down. Perhaps the seriousness of the health, health outcomes of COVID has heightened a, focused, um, a focus on keeping everyone healthy, not just focusing on self, self. After all, the stakes are somewhat higher if anyone in the family contracts COVID. Um, the bottom line on the chart there, um, agreement or disagreement with the statement, by making changes to my diet, I can significantly improve my health. Given this is the whole reason for um, HV, the HVN program, I thought I'd focus on this a little bit because we're looking to develop New Zealand products to support health. Um, this has decreased since 2019 across the board. Um, we believe that the change of diet could is an impact of concern. However, we've seen that, excuse me, however, we have seen that many have in fact changed their diet to include more fruit and vegetables. So Whilst they're saying it's less of a concern, they have made those positive changes when we've drilled down to those sorts of details. But as I alluded to a little bit earlier, it's not just about diet is what we're getting from the survey. It's about eating more fruit and vegetables, but it's also about getting out there and exercising more, looking for products with health plans, taking more supplements, those sorts of things. It's not just one silver bullet. The interesting thing in this particular chart, I suppose, is that the quality of life is high, whilst not consistent across all groups. Some people have clearly thought that life was good during COVID. And I think there's, there's always a few people, and there's probably people watching this presentation today that quite enjoyed the working from home, not having the commute, having being at home with your family, being able to work from the garden, all those sorts of things. So I think there's a little bit of a reflection of those sorts of behaviours happening there. So this battery is all about healthing, healthy eating habits and the statements there. Um, I think a lot of what's happening in this chart is talking to the general disruption to normal everyday eating habits during the pandemic. Consumers were less inclined to avoid treats and were perhaps eating more comfort food and also eating at more irregular times as they weren't having to commute and they weren't locked into that daily routine that they were when they were having to go into the office every day. Um, so looking at the statement, looking at some of these statements, there are likely to be behaviours uh, connected to pandemic living, while the more sustained beliefs are around eating tasty foods, but preparing them in healthier ways. And this is something we've seen in other projects that we've done here at PFR not so long ago. China is the biggest consumer of pork in the world. And it's interesting though to see, and this could be around the comfort eating, I'm not giving up my treats, they're not going to eat less pork. But on the same hand, they're all saying there's a high proportion of them and it's increasing that they are going to prepare the pork in a more healthy way. So that's interesting news and there's a behavior change that's being reiterated there. Okay, first, Top the part of this chart is looking at statements that relate to barriers to a healthy lifestyle. We found there's quite a bit of variability in the responses to these statements, and this perhaps reflects the individual circumstance of each respondent. So there, generally they felt there are many barriers in my life that prevent me from having a healthy diet. That's gone down a little bit since the last, since the last survey. But interestingly enough, that is pretty much restricted to those people with a health condition. So these are people who have already been have, having to make allowances to their health concerns in their diet and their lifestyle and those sorts of things. But now they're in COVID or they're surviving through COVID, they're less, less agreeing with that statement, probably because their life, and it seems a bit easier, they don't have the stress and all that time spent commuting. They can take a bit more time over eating well during the day. They've got a bit more time to do that exercise that they always intended to do. 
So people in those health conditions have perhaps had a bit of a, a better ride in terms of managing those issues. Um, at the bottom there, we've got access to information about health and wellbeing and what people thought about that. Uh, what was interesting was the response to this information from overseas companies about health and wellbeing as being trustworthy, because clearly that's something that applies to us. Um, we didn't see a big, we didn't see a change. Pretty much the scores stayed the same between 2019 and 2020 here. Um, so that was a good thing to hear. And as we move through this presentation, there's a few more attributes that relate specifically more to New Zealand and that angle of um, trustworthiness and how much they um, rely on that as a cue. So this battery of questions highly highlighted here because there's quite a lot of relevant and interesting things happening is around trust in food and beverages with health claims. So the fact we've got so many down arrows with a lot of staying the same in this point in this slide is that we found generally there's less trust in health claims since the 2019 study. Though in the earlier slide, we did see that there are around 30% of people who are more inclined to seek out health claims than they were before COVID, but we can't. So, but this is also, this is a bit of a concern around what we're trying to build up and what we're trying to establish through COVID, uh, through HVN, apologies. Okay, further down there, while overseas universities and testing that uses Chinese um, people in terms of clinical trials and so forth, so I'm looking at the top two rows in this chart now, have gone down. Word of mouth, which we know from previous research is the most trusted source of information and recommendation in this market, has remained unchanged, indicating this is still a key area to focus our efforts in terms of communications and promotion. Um, also, the strength of the brand, having a natural aspect and being made in New Zealand have, maintained, have managed to maintain a constant level of trust in terms of the responses to these scores since the pandemic, which is all good news for us. The fact that New Zealand is already held in high regard in terms of trust is very good news. And at the end of the presentation, I will ask Ivy to come on and give you an overview of our next study, which is going to look at investigating DIGOs in New Zealand, which is a way people in China get, China, uh, get New Zealand products uh, from New Zealand following, this is a, a highly trusted channel of getting products. So it bounces off the back of that statement around trust in New Zealand products. Okay, the use of medicines, multivitamins and supplements. Um, there's a few double negatives in these charts, which make it slightly confusing to understand. But the top line there, we're seeing that people were less concerned about the long term effects of using Western medications. Now, during our qualitative studies, we found it reiterated over and over again how this was a big issue. But I think given the focus of COVID and the extreme health conditions that have come out of it, there is a little bit more trust around that now. If we drop to the, the bottom of that top block, we see I don't believe TCM are effective for treating conditions. Now this is a double negative, so they're less trusting of that statement, which means that they are trusting TCM that much more to help with their health condition. And I think again, this is coming down to this, it's not just gonna be one thing. We're gonna to look to Western medicine and we're going to look to TCM. And this isn't new news, but perhaps the, um, the trust around Western medicine has come up a bit since we last visited it in um, some of our qualitative studies. Um, in terms of food safety, respondents disagreed moderately to the statement, I am not concerned about the safety of my food. Again, a double negative in there, so they are concerned about it. And um, this demonstrates the, how untrusting these people can be about their food sources in China. And this has remained unchanged after the pandemic. On the other hand, there was general agreement with the statement that I trust food from New Zealand as being safe. A sentiment, a sentiment which has also stayed stable since COVID. Though counter to this, most groups are more likely to say that the country of origin of a food is not as import an important consideration when deciding whether a food is safe to eat or drink. So perhaps in terms of New Zealand, brand New Zealand and HBN products, this data is suggesting that we hedge our bets with this intelligence and make it clear that a product is from New Zealand. And as we know, the perceptions around brand New Zealand are highly, pos are highly positive. So much so that we have these DIGO channels 
who are seeking not only products made in New Zealand, but this, this concept of products that are sold in New Zealand as well. So avoiding that possibility of tampering at the New Zealand, uh, at the Chinese end of the retail chain. Okay, I'm powering through this now because I'm getting quite conscious of time. So this is the last data slide I'm going to show you. So this time, what was the general interest in functional foods between the two surveys? And as you can see, all of our um, condition groups are scoring lower. So there's less agreement with each of these statements. So again, reiterating a reduction in the trust placed in the health claims. However, I did want to point out, while these downward results look quite negative, consumers still agree that they would try functional foods and that they'd pay more for them and that they believe their life would be easier if these products were available. They just agree marginally less than they did in 2019. So with the right mix of credible health claims, natural aspects to the ingredients, being New Zealand made and sold, which is something we might need we'll look at later, as well as earning that all important word of mouth recommendation, we're still on track for developing highly compelling HVM products for this market. That is the last of my data slides, because I don't want to bombard you with too many numbers. What I do want to do is really direct you to the HVM website. And that's the link. Once you get there, you'll see there's two reports. So there's a full pre-COVID study and the secondary study is the post-COVID study, which also compares the results from both. And you can drill down into whatever health condition or more general level is of more interest to you and your business and um, come back to us and ask any questions at all that you want to from there. So now I think we're going to have a look and see if we've got any questions coming through up in the chat. I don't know how to get that. <laughs> chat. Stop sharing. Okay, stop sharing. Thank you. Okay, we don't have any questions currently. Excellent. So if nobody has any questions, what we, what we will do is, I mean, I, have, I will encourage you to go and look at those reports. Um, but before you do leave us today, I would like to take the opportunity to bring Dr. Ivy Gann into the webinar, just to talk through our next planned project that we've got going on within the Consumer Insights app part of High Value Nutrition. So I will bring up that presentation again and find a good slide. Um, Kia ora everyone and thank you for staying with us and um, my name is Ivy and I'm a consumer scientist at Plant and Food Research. I've been uh, working closely with the HBN Consumer Insights team uh, since Change 1 and happy to share uh, uh, the um, upcoming study that we are uh, planning at the moment is about understanding Chinese consumers through the eyes of daigos. I trust many of you are not new to the word daigo. This is the Chinese Mandarin term of um, buying on behalf. And some of you may be quite familiar with this uh, form of business practice. And to put it simple, we um, here refer daigo as a loose term um, referring to Chinese people living in New Zealand who purchase New Zealand products on behalf of people in China and then send these products back to China for these um, customers. And daigo is also the term for this uh, buying on behalf practice. So daigos are different in terms of their business scale and their customer base and how they organize purchase and shipment, et cetera. And some of them may just act on a very casual basis to earn some pocket money. And some of them operate Daigo as a very significant um, business. And although there is no official figure about Daigo, for example, it's business volume and the size of the Daigo population in New Zealand, and but no doubt, um, Daigo is playing a very unique role uh, between uh, Chinese customers and New Zealand 
products. So in this upcoming study, we would like to take a deep dive into this special form of business and learn more from um, uh, learn more about Chinese consumers through the lenses of Daigo. And in particular, we would like to learn from Daigo's um, firstly whether Chinese consumers attitudes and perceptions towards New Zealand food and wellness products and their demand of New Zealand products have ever changed uh, since uh, COVID-19. And we also want to take this opportunity to have a further look into the Daigo and consumer relationships and explore the role of Daigo in the wider supply chain. And as Chelsea just mentioned, um, we see this is very important because by nature, the Daigo business mode is really heavily relying on trust. And in this trust relation, we want to explore how message regarding New Zealand food um, products are communicated to uh, Chinese consumers and what a New Zealand food story is being constructed in this Daigo practice. And more specifically, um, we want to address other concerns of interest to New Zealand's food and beverage industry. And yes, we want some input from the industry. And if you and your business have any um, uh, specific issues of significance to your business and on this topic, please don't hesitate to let us know. And you can either raise it at the webinar session uh, through the chat later on or just uh, flick us an email. And um, yeah, we'll try to uh, we'll try the best to uh, address your issues in the study. And back to the study, we plan to um, conduct in-depth interviews with Daigos, firstly to gather um, some rich and um, comprehensive description. And then based on the findings from the interviews, we are to craft a survey, which then will be administered to uh, the wider Daigo population um, with a bigger sample size um, to get more generalizable um, insights. And upon completion, we will deliver, uh, deliver um, internal HVN reports as usual. And we will also organize um, um, industry workshop or webinar like the sessions that we are having today and yeah and again um, just let us know if you uh, you know, have any concerns about uh, Daigo business and anything that you want to know and we will try to capture that in our study yeah thank you thanks Ivy now I'm going to put on my old nana hat and see if I can work out whether we've got any comments here chat yet. Excuse me, buddy. Okay, thank you. Great. Let me, I'm sorry, I'm just reading a few reports. Full report and it's saying, okay, people are running into issues with the authorization on the Auckland University um, logins. What you need to do is just write to them and Re and request a password and that will come through just email. yeah so email them or email me and we'll get you sorted out there because all of the reports and I must of course I'm just talking about the latest ones that we've done but all of those fabulous qualitative reports from 2017 to 19 will sit on there as well and that's just in the consumer insights section there's all sorts of other stuff on there what do you see with regards to the, okay, I might need to bring my panel members up to join me now. So Ivy and Denise are going to come up to the podium and we'll answer a few of these questions. What do you see the regard, the, excuse me, what do you see with regard to the trend of the consumption of meat alternatives and plant-based products? There's a lot of hype and a lot of overseas companies are trying to break into the Chinese markets, but there's a lot of cheap alternatives as well, local alternatives. Hmm. <laughs> um, I'll start with this one. So uh, was it two or three years ago, we were in China doing some research with consumers about um, uh, plant-based plant -based diet. diets and, and alternatives. And there was very, very little reception for it at that time. People were really um, not looking for that. And I think that this has started to change as it's changed uh, throughout the world. But what we're now starting to see is that people are actually wanting quality alternatives. And that's a world trend as well, that people are wanting 
and um, perhaps the plant-based foods that are familiar with, to them or look familiar, <clears throat> excuse me, so they know how to cook them and they're familiar with a pate the same as they would a, a meat pate. Uh, but they actually want the quality to be a lot more superior than it is right now. Because, and I think the COVID um, is definitely feeding that as well, that people are getting much more conscious of, of nutrient. Thank you, Denise. Um, that's our only question today. You're leaving us off extremely lightly. Uh, we need another tray. Okay, oh goodness. Oh. I need to get in. Oh, that's um, long one. Lengthy. Okay. 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 Please share panel's views on improving Māori presence, perceptions, impact in Asian food markets. Fostering stronger Māori visibility and presence in Asian markets will also benefit the overall business, cultural and political relationships between New Zealand and Asian countries such as China. In brief, within New Zealand, we know Māori groups are producing safe and good quality foods from sustainable food practices. Ding, 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 including products exclusively by Māori groups and that within New Zealand collective production. However, there are important gaps to fill, such as improving Māori presence, perception, impact associated with current, I've lost my place, <laughs> whoops, uh, where are we? The enabling normal customers to know more on the Māori elements behind the New Zealand products, shortening the distance between Māori plant and food producers and the upper end of Asian markets. Anything to... I think that's, you know, wonderful points there. As the Consumer Insights team, um, we are always really, really wanting and banging on doors and trying to get insights from our industry in terms of what they are doing and what it is that they are needing as well. Um, and we really welcome those conversations very much. Um, we don't have the ability to get people into market because that's not our mandate, but we do have a lot of marketing experience between us. Um, and we do have a lot of consumer insights information within these markets. And what we are missing often is the industry view. And we know you're really busy, all speaking to all industry, and we really, really appreciate it when we come knocking on your doors and you give of your time, because we do, you know, when times are good, we do go into China and we do want to actually go in informed by our industry partners. Um, and we would really welcome anyone who would like a conversation with us to please let yourselves be known and um, and you'll be getting an email from us lickety split. <laughs> and I think New Zealand Trade and Enterprise are very active in this area as well with very active Māori engagement schemes and so forth and taking groups out to Asia and trying to help them learn a little bit about the market and giving them some insights on the ground out there too. So that's another door to knock on. Yeah, and adding to that, um, from my memory, I, I used to read lots of, um, well, New Zealand uh, traveling, promoting material in the Chinese market. So um, I guess New Zealand is telling a good story about, um, you know, the New Zealand culture and the history of Maori, because I always see that they will mention that, um, you know, Maori is um, the New Zealand's indigenous people and um, their well, history and their various this stuff in those kind of material. And I think that will be a good opportunity to incorporating the Maori story and their food and um, their food culture, their practice in that way as well. So not just telling, well, it's a good place, go to Rotorua to have a look and experience the Maori way, but also uh, promoting um, Maori food and Maori business in the food domain as well. Mm -hmm. Um, another question's come through. It's um, a bit of a how long is a piece of string question. <laughs> what is the estimated premium price prepared to be paid for quality, ethically sourced, safe and nutritious food? Hmm. Yeah, I think that is a bit of a how long is this 
we do know that there is a willingness to pay a premium. Um, that said, the range tends to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ivy, between 10 and 30 percent. Yeah, and also depending on how desperate that you yes. want that and how um, the benefit of that food is relating to your own uh, individual, you know, the, the health condition. And the guarantee. And this is where the trust is so important. So this is where the DIGO study is coming into it, its own here. It's really that if people can trust that what is in the box is what is on the label, then they will pay more. But there is so much counterfeit that that is sometimes a, a real moderator. Yeah, interestingly um, enough, just this morning, <laughs> I got a message from a friend in China asking for some opinions from me. It's about the same issue. She's wanting to buy some uh, baby formula for her daughter, but she's really worrying about getting kind of face from um, the conventional um, Chinese retail channels. And she's asking me, um, what can I do? <laughs> <laughs> so we know that there is enormous trust and faith in the entirety of the supply chain within New Zealand, from grower to when it's actually in the box. It is what happens to that when it leaves New Zealand, if it even leaves New Zealand, that is the, the concern for the trust. So that is something perhaps for industry to be to be working on and, and not a small issue, I do understand. Yeah, it's not just the supply chain, but also the chain of trust. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thank you, ladies. That seems to be our last question that's popped up there. And no, it's interesting. Uh, Oh, sorry, new one. In, did anyone hear interested in hearing about how and what environmental labeling schemes are currently implemented in understanding the environmental impacts of our products? Is there more to that? No, that's the bottom. So, assuming you mean in China, are you aware of anything in your travels? Yeah, China. Um, I guess the labeling is always an interesting issue anywhere, and in China is, is really interesting. Um, again, there's lack of faith or trust in lots of labeling, in that, you know, it, it could be just um, a fake. Um, including, you know, there's a blue hat which many of you will be familiar with, which is incredibly expensive to actually get. But when we talked to consumers, they were really one, unaware of it, and two, just kind of poo-pooed it as an idea that that would guarantee anything. So I think um, labeling per se is still a bit problematic. Yeah, and I can't recall any specific environmental um, labeling, which, I mean, uh, addressing the benefits to the environment rather than um, people would like to have like the green um, green products which indicates that the product it's you know using the product is using green ingredients and from a pure uh, clean environment rather than what the benefits to the environment but a good environment benefits the product from that environment Okay, this time. Thank you. Okay. I think that is all of our questions. I will pop back up here and put up a bit of a contact slide to finish. So I would like to thank you all for joining us today. I know there was an awful lot of data there. I, again, encourage you to go and dig out those reports. Get in touch with me, there's my email, or reach out directly to the HVN people about getting into that knowledge section of the HVN um, website. But hopefully we'll see you all again soon when we're delivering Ivy's new research project around zygos in New Zealand. So thank you all. See you all again thank you. soon. Thank you. Thanks to um, Ivy and thanks very much to Tracy for doing such a great job with all that data. So thanks so much, everyone, and we'll hopefully talk again soon. Thank you.